So, very welcome uh, to this lecture. Uh, we, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. Uh, we will, despite the weather is nice outside, we will be inside all day uh, coding JavaScript. So this is a uh, divided lecture. I will start off, yeah, I, I need that one to see that it works and it works this time, I hope. Uh, yeah, if the ones watching at home, uh, if it's not working, please write in the chat. I will try to uh, have an eye on the chat as well during the lecture. Uh, I know why some things failed last time, but there might be some other troubles this time. But we'll see about that. So, last week I didn't go to Vecor. Uh, instead, uh, I hope you all watched uh, the recorded lecture, uh, lecture number three in the course, uh, because today's lecture is kind of building upon that one. In that lecture, I introduced JavaScript uh, and more or less the basic syntax of JavaScript. Um, and I, I would like to stress that this is not a introduction course. It's not, not uh, a G1 uh, course, it's a G1F course. So, so that means that this course has prerequisites. Those prerequisites being you should all be familiar with object-oriented programming. Uh, in, for instance, Java, which I think is the most that most of you have done before, uh, but could be in C Sharp or any other object-oriented language. Because today, this lecture, will kind of uh, build upon that you know what inheritance is, is, for instance, because otherwise you will be totally lost today. Uh, and if, if, if you haven't, pro I, I, I actually think there are students that haven't program at, programmed at all before, then this is not the course for you. You will be really miserable these coming weeks if you haven't programmed a single line before. That, that's just how it is. And, um, the prerequisites of the courses. I think many of you are program students, right, from the, uh, the, the software technology program. You have all taken the 1DV507 or something with uh, Jonas Lundberg, and this is kind of building upon that course. Um, okay, so first some quick announcements uh, before we start. Uh, I would like to show introduction to web programming, the course web page. Um, and I will switch and I don't think, oh, it worked, I think. Let's just see if the stream works as well. Pressing the button. Woohoo, great. Uh, so, um, on the course webpage I post uh, important information. Uh, we could start with this one. So. Each week, uh, this week on Friday, I will release a short vlog. Uh, me just recording some basic information about the course, some announcements, and if, I mean, we have uh, tutoring on, 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 uh, uh, on Friday, and I could, in this vlog, I could catch up. If, if there is some, some, some questions that all of you need to know, I could show them off in, in the vlog. So please watch those. Uh, the other thing we need to do is to do this three-week registration thing. So you not only do you need to register on the course, you also need to tell me that you are active on the course three weeks into the course. And this is three weeks into the course. So this week you need to tell me that you are active. And you tell me that you are active by doing at least one commit in one of your re repos, wi wi whichever, in the exercises, in the examination one, or whatever. But ha if you have done <coughs> one commit uh, so far, you're fine. Then, then you don't need to think about this. However, if you haven't done any commits yet and pushed to GitHub, then you really need to do that because otherwise I will just uh, uh, remove you from the course. So please do. The deadline for this is tomorrow. Uh, and uh, yeah, th that, that's pretty simple, actually. Uh, you will 
probably get some kind of notification that you are unregistered as well. So you can act upon that if you like. Um, what's, yeah, so tomorrow, no, Friday, uh, you have deadline for the first examination assignment. Uh, I think it's at noon. Yep. Uh, so what you should have done by then is just completed the first assignment. And as I said in the course introduction, this assignment is a uh, hand-in only assignment. So, so if you hand it in, you will get feedback. Uh, the feedback will start roll out next week. Uh, we are four people that will give feedback. Um, uh, and we give the feedback by doing, by actually adding an issue on your GitHub repository. So github.com, if you go to the organization, hopefully I have a student account. Yep. So, so this is, this could be my hand, hand in. Uh, when we look at it, we will create a new issue uh, in, in this repository. Like uh, assignment one, great, you pass. Well, we will <laughs> probably write something more, but uh, you will get the information if you pass or if you fail or if you need to do some kind of complementary work on your assignment, you will get it as a, an issue. Uh, if, if you have, have an email connected to GitHub, uh, the, I think on the primary email you will get an, a notification as well. Uh, if you have any questions about the issue or your complementary work, just add a new comment and we can have a discussion about this assignment as an issue. Uh, when, uh, when you're done reading this uh, and you comply with the result, you just close the issue and that, 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 that is done. Um, but you will get instructions here. Questions about this? No. So you will not get an email from us saying something. We will communicate over GitHub. Uh, and you will sh see the points going into Lodoc as well, of course. Uh, okay, so I will, that's that with the first part of the course, the HTML and CSS part. The HTML and CSS part is only here for you to be able to create web applications. And starting with the lecture I uh, recorded, that is kind of the first step, again, being able to program in JavaScript. Uh, as you can see, there are two lectures, lecture three and four. I, I a couple of years ago, I, I had those lectures over the course of one day uh, as two lectures. However, there is so much information in tho those two that, that it just b blew everybody's mind. So, so I've divided this into two, two, two days instead. So last week was lecture three and today is lecture four. So lecture four is actually divided before lunch and after lunch. It will probably not be a full four hours, maybe three hours. Um, I will not need to stress this time as I had to do last year because then, then I had to say the same thing in 90 minutes. Uh, so we could have like more times for questions and basically take it a little bit easier than last year. Uh, I will code quite a lot today and show examples um, and today just as last week I will code in uh, uh, in the console or in node so uh, we will not code in the browser today however starting next week I think it's next week well it's at least lecture five then we will introduce the browser and uh, start coding in the browser instead uh, JavaScript is quite versatile in that it, I mean, you can run JavaScript pretty much anywhere, uh, of course, on the web, but you can run it as an application platform on the server. You can run it inside of other programs. JavaScript is, is quite versatile and it's really, really commonly used. It's probably one of the most used languages uh, today, probably compete, competing with Java. Um, so today we will just focus on the basics of the language. We will not look at APIs uh, 
connecting you to, to, to the browser in any way. We'll just look at the basic syntax of the language and compare that syntax more or less to how you're used to in other languages. Because JavaScript has this background that is quite special. I think I mentioned last time that, that it was created in 10 days. Uh, and to create a whole language in 10 days, you, you messed things up, uh, basically. And that is what happened with JavaScript. So many of the bad parts in JavaScript could have been avoided if, if, if the development time was a little bit longer. Uh, during, I mean, since 95, a lot of things has happened. We have new standards, and those standards are introducing uh, things in the language that makes probably you as a Java developer comfortable because you will recognize some things that you're used to in Java that you now can do in JavaScript as well. Uh, and also fixing some bugs. But it's, it's really hard to fix bugs in a language like JavaScript or HTML or CSS because there are so many web pages dependen depending on those bugs. So if you fix the bug, you will break the web, basically. So, so the standard committee has a quite a hard task in, in fixing things, but doing it in a way that you don't break old, 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 the old web. Um, and yeah, we will, we will uh, look at some of those things today as well. Um, a question often asked is, so it was, I mean, the prerequisites of the course is object-oriented programming, but you might have done object-oriented programming in the 90s. So, so you haven't programmed in 20 years. Where to start? Well, I should say where to start is by reading in the book. Uh, so this uh, eloquent JavaScript, the third edition, the new one, uh, is kind of written for the audience that you are in. Like, people who have programmed in other languages but now want to transition to JavaScript. So, th so this book is actually quite a good match uh, for you. So I would recommend just yes, starting at the introduction and, and just working your way through the, the literature. Um, I'm not always recommending <laughs> reading literature, but I do now. So when I recommend something, <laughs> I think this is, <laughs> this is, exactly what you need, I would say. Uh, and um, if you look at this, we could actually uh, visit the book. Um, if you look at the content of this book, it's divided into three parts, part one, part two, and part three. The part one being language. So this is basically part one, what I will did last week and this week. So. After this lecture, you should be somewhere around the 10th uh, chapter. I will introduce a chapter 11 a little bit later on when we work in the browser. Uh, chapter 14 to 18 is working with the browser. That starts next week. Uh, part 3 is introducing Node as an application platform. That is nothing you need to do for this course. However, that will be interesting in the follow-up course, the 1DV523. So focus, first of all, focus on part one. Uh, and I will kind of get you through most of what is in uh, that part. Uh, uh, okay. Any questions so far? And I need to check Slack and that's fine and that's fine, good. Then we will get started with today's lecture. Um, when you have, t uh, when you have uh, programmed in other languages, data structures is one of those topics that is uh, always um, coming up. Uh, and you have probably had Jonas uh, describing a lot of data structures for you. He has probably also said that arrays, for instance, isn't a data structure. It's a implementation of a stack or something, something like that. Uh, however, uh, I would, in, in the sake of this course, I will say that an array is a data structure. Uh, and we have quite a 
we, we don't have so many data structures in JavaScript. We basically have arrays and objects, and that is more or less that. In the newer versions, we have a weak mapping and a couple of other data structures, but they are more or less just an abstraction upon the basic um, IDs in the language. Um, so let's go ahead and look at arrays. So arrays is a way to collect a lot of values in, a, in an array. <laughs> uh, so if you look at this example, and I will actually copy this example to my uh, Visual Studio Code so I could make it a little bit larger. Whoa, that was a little bit too much. Maybe like that. Can you see that? Yeah, I think you can, right? So, uh, looking at this, uh, this is actually creating an array, adding a value to the array, and then uh, just logging the size of the array. If you were to do this in Java, you would probably have something like creating a variable holding an array of strings, and then doing some kind of new array or something like that. I'm not familiar, there might be a new syntax to Java, so, so that is kind of like this. But in JavaScript, it's really simple. To create an array, you just create a variable, and you use brackets, and that's it. That is an empty array. And then you can just add values, comma separated, you can use push, you can do a pull. I think you're quite familiar with that. Uh, the funny thing in JavaScript, remember it's not a hard typed language, it's a loosely typed language. That means you can do things like this. So what we've got here is an array consisting of three strings, an integer and another array. You, you can do that. It's, it's, I mean, it's totally valid. So length, length is six. That doesn't mean that you should do this. I mean, you, you can do that, but you shouldn't do that. Uh, always try to have an array, uh, values in array of the same type. Uh, and I mean, often when you get an array, it's really uncommon for you to, to like create the array manually. You will probably get those values from an API somewhere like uh, a, an image API consisting of all uh, image URLs on that particular hashtag or something like that. Um, you can do this, you should not do that. Um, um, but arrays are pretty simple. Uh, they, I mean, another way to, to create arrays is actually to do const r equals new array, new array, and that will create an empty array. Uh, but as you will probably see, using the new keyword and uh, uh, instantiating objects from types, this is called a type, you would say class in JavaScript probably, uh, in Java probably, but using new on types like this, it's quite, not how you do it actually, because you have a shorthand. You have the shorthand of just using brackets, and that is often easier. Uh, so this is creating in sim simple as that. Questions on that? You're free to ask questions today because we have a lo long time to today. Okay. What is that? Use strict. Did I explain that in, in last week? Because last week I held last year, so I don't exactly remember what I said, but Use strict is one of those mechanisms in, in JavaScript to, to kind of get rid of some bugs. So if you write use strict in the top of your file, you're kind of telling the JavaScript uh, interpreter compiler to interpret this code in a strict mode, which eliminates some of those bugs. Exactly what bugs, you can always Google use strict on MDN and uh, uh, Mozilla Developer Network and you will get a long list of all things that are fixed. But it's often a good practice to use strict. There is, however, as I will come to later today, 
there is a special case when we use something called modules, you don't need to use strict because you strict this. Uh, in, uh, in modules, everything is strict anyways, so you don't need to write it. But starting out now, we could use this line of use strict. And this should always be in the top of the file and it will cover the whole file. You could add it inside of a function, then that function will use strict and everything outside is not using strict. But as a rule of thumb, just add it to the top of the file. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, okay, let's move on. Of course, if, if you, I mean, I will just say arrays are simple to work with. If you want to find out all the methods, all the properties on arrays, you could always just go on Mozilla Developer Network, look in the documentation and you will find those methods. But I mean, you have push, you have pull and you have length. You will get, get, get quite, quite far with those properties and methods. Uh, okay. If you were to, I mean, if I were to give you a task of, of writing all of those separate strings into the console, uh, how would you go about doing that? Just with what you know from before. Any suggestions? <coughs> yeah, a for loop. Probably a simple for loop, just iterating <coughs> over each index <coughs> and just console logging it. Let's do that. Uh, let's, oh, well, before we get to the for loop, I just explain why it says const. Uh, so we have three var variable types. In, in JavaScript since ECMAScript 2015, I think it was introduced. Uh, before, we always did like that, var, indicating that this is a variable. However, there are some, as I, I probably explained last week, there are some things with var that is quite unusual to you. That being that vars are uh, uh, not block scoped. Uh, and you are used to block scoped uh, variables and that's why I tend to use let or const instead because they are, you will probably avoid bugs by doing that. Const is a constant. However, this, is, this, is, this array is a constant. However, I'm still able to push into that array and that is because arrays are reference types. So you need to, to, to discri discri distinguish between reference types and primitive uh, or value types. So value types stored on the stack, copied when you send them into a function. Reference types, they are reference to the heap. Uh, so we could do things like this. Um, we have the course code uh, and we could do, do a const uh, courses equals course codes uh, and then we log course I think I courses this is the bad thing with coding live course it's right right yeah courses so I log courses So I did a change to course codes. However, when I log courses, cor uh, the one dev 022 is, is still in that one. And that is because both courses and course codes are referencing the same uh, memory in the heap. So it's a reference type. That is really, really important to distinguish, disting distinguish between the primitive types and the reference types. Uh, however, since this is a reference type, I could actually use const. I wouldn't be able to do something like this, co uh, course codes equals 12, because now I'm removing the reference and adding a value. And this will, it actually warns me as well, uh, this will crash because it uh, says that you cannot assign uh, a new value to const. However, I could still change what the reference is pointing at. Okay, so reference types, you could, could always use const when you declare them, like arrays, objects, functions, 
things like that. Um, okay, we were supposed to uh, show all the values. And I will do that by using a simple for loop. The for loops look exactly the same as in other languages. I equals, we start by zero because it's zero indexed. Uh, as long as I is less than a course code dot length, uh, I plus plus, something like that. Whoops. Uh, same thing here, using let, we say that this i will only be available inside of the scope. So, so i is available inside of the for loop. If I were to use var, you would be able to reference i after the for loop, and that is probably something you won't, do not want to do. Uh, course codes, course codes i. So this construction is pretty straightforward. You've probably done it in, in more or less any language you've tried. Uh, we will get a console log for each and every element in the course codes. However, uh, first of all, I mean, I love for loops uh, because I know how to write them <laughs> and I've always used them. So, so if I want to fall back on anything in any language, I know I, know I could always call on a for loop and that will probably work uh, quite neatly. However, uh, in JavaScript, I mean, this syntax, we're having a basic course in Kalma right now in JavaScript with students who have never programmed before. Learning the syntax of a for loop is quite <coughs> quirky. It's, I mean, they're questioning, why are we having semicolons in the for loop? You said we shouldn't use semicolons for, for line endings. Oh, well, but the exception is in for loops because you divide the blocks by semicolons still inside of the for loop. Uh, and I mean, you should always, you always need to think, oh, should it be less than or less equal? And what happens if it's less e and equal? Well, what would have happened in JavaScript, uh, in Java if I did that? An exception, in JavaScript you will not get an exception, you will just get undefined because we will step over, uh, we will not like in C or something like that, go into the next memory slot. So you will not get, can, get, get like a buffer overflow thingy. But it will just say undefined because course codes number five is undefined. Uh, so you need to, to know that, you need to like, and always when I tend to use for loops, I always get someone asking, well, isn't it better to like do plus plus i, you can get a performance boost by 0.0, .0 microseconds per CPU cycle. Now, I don't know, but yeah, probably. You could probably tweak this and you will get a microsecond out of it somewhere. However, this is JavaScript. It's not uh, like nuclear physics. Uh, working with JavaScript, you tend to always have a network connection somewhere down the line. And hunting milliseconds in a for loop compared to the latency over the web, that is kind of nothing. However, with newer, more and more things going into the browser, you will probably have to do some optimization uh, on your code. But please don't do premature optimization. So don't like think optimization when you write the code at this stage. Just think of writing code that is easy to understand. In the next phase, you could like analyze your code. You see that, oh, this function is really slow. Why is that? And then you could like start to analyze it. So this is probably quite fast code for the compiler to, to, to interpret it. Yep. If you use an isolation keyword, would you change the size of the uh, code? Uh, would, we, uh, would we change the uh, size of the course codes? You will not change any size. It will still be uh, the same length but the, the inter interpreter will say that, okay, it's undefined. So. Um, please use for loops if you like. However, uh, there are better ways in JavaScript uh, and one way is using something called iterator functions. So an iter iterator function is a, f um, remember last lecture I said that we have the concept of higher order functions, right? 
I'm looking at you because you, you, you saw that lecture last time. Uh, um, so a higher order function is a function that is acting upon another function. The, the ability for you to send functions as references to other functions. Um, uh, just as well as you can send a reference to an array into a function, you can send a reference to a function into a function. And this could be, can you do that in Java? I don't think so, but Java is evol evolving, so maybe. I, I haven't written Java in like 15 years, so yeah. Uh, but higher order functions are quite um, powerful. Uh, and they allow us to do something called iterator functions. So instead of doing this, we could use an iter iterator function called for each. So in this case, we take our uh, uh, array and we invoke uh, the for each method. So arrays has a built-in method called for each. And this for each takes a callback function as a parameter. Okay. Um, you just have to look at the slack so it doesn't, so it's still working. Okay. For each. So this function takes another function as a parameter and we can do that by assigning that to a anonymous function. So I create a new function like that. Whoops, sorry. Uh, no. Uh, okay, like that. And then we need that parenthesis like that. So what is happening here? So we are sending a function into the for each function. This function will get as an argument when the compiler calls this function, the argument here uh, and the, yeah, the parameter for us will be uh, each and every element in the array. So this, will, this function will be called four times and for each time it is called, course corresponds to one element in, in the array. And we could do a console.log uh, course like that, run it and it's the same result as with the for loop. It's still quite cluttery, it's a lot of parentheses and uh, 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 curly brackets and things. Remember I talked about something called uh, arrow functions uh, in the last lecture. Arrow functions is just another syntax way of writing functions instead of using this notation. So this you are quite used to. However, the, the, the arrow function notation looks like this. So we could remove that one. We add an arrow instead. Uh, and then we have the block of what to do, like that. And we write it, run it and it's the same thing. So what now we're starting to minimize the code. And we write it on the same line. And now you can always also see that not using semicolons in JavaScript is quite a good thing be because otherwise we would need like a semicolon there and one there. It looks quite quirky. So removing those is quite good. Okay, a one-liner for just logging all the courses. It would be even simpler if this arrow function were to return something. Say it would return, okay, so did I talk about uh, functions without side effects or have you heard about functions without side effects before? So a function without, a s is, is this a function without a side effect? No. It's not because it's doing something with the console. So, so that function is modifying something outside of the function. This not being uh, uh, a pure function. Uh, instead, a function should have an argument and return something and not changing the world around it. Uh, and we could do that. Of course, we could return course. That is not doing much because what this will do uh, <coughs> am I d 
doing something wrong. Ma, pa, pa, no, that should actually work. <coughs> Try that. Uh, it's returning, it turned course. Uh, I didn't prepare this. Why isn't that return course for each? Ah, well, for each is actually not returning anything. Uh, uh, it's just acting upon. We will need to use map or reduce or something. I will show that later on, actually. So don't mind that example. That was stupid. However, if, uh, just to sh show what I'm, I were supposed to show. So if you're re returning something from, from an arrow function, you could always use the shorthand of removing the brackets and removing return. So this is actually return. This say, okay, take the parameter course and return course. Of course, you would probably want to do something with the course, like just concatenating something into that string and however for each is not creating a new i probably if we look at for each it will say it returns void so 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 it yeah it, it returns undefined basically but i will show other functions soon okay let's go back to where i were oh like it would be faster to write it once again okay like that um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that is the for each. If you want to, a really common example is that you want to like filter, uh, say that you have a l an array of uh, URLs and you only want URLs starting with HTTPS, for instance. You want to remove all the other uh, URLs from from this array, then you can do something called filter. Uh, in this example, I am uh, having an array of courses. I call filter. Uh, I could remove those parentheses. I get a node. So the node is each course. You could call it node. You can call it course code in this case, I guess it's the best uh, thing. Um, and in this case, I will check for all courses that has the five something in it, uh, indicating that it's a course given in, e in English, basically, uh, for LNU. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm checking if node dot character at three so just looking at that character in the string, if that equals five, then this will be truthy. And filter works like this. For every iteration, if the function returns true, it will create a new array with that value. And if it returns false, that value will be skipped. So in this case, this will give us all courses for international students. Uh, if you were to do this in, uh, in with a for loop, you will have to iterate over the loop and have a if statement inside of the loop with this condition and save that to a temporary empty array. And uh, yeah, that is basically it. So, so, but this is even neater. And in this case, I'm utilizing the thing that this actually is the same thing as doing return. That is exactly the same thing with arrow functions. Uh, I have a, a bigger example coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other iterator functions as well. Map, uh, you can use map if you have, say that you have um, an array consisting of an object with a lot of uh, other uh, with properties. You could l kind of uh, remove or just pick one of those properties from that uh, object 
and create an array of those properties. We will see that soon as well. Uh, reduce, I could probably write on, because, ah, pencils, I have one. Need to change the camera, boom. So having an array like this, three, nine, six, seven, just an array of integers. If you do, do a reduce on this one, uh, you're saying basically start with zero and then take the next value and the previous value and do something with those values. For instance, add them. So if we use add, uh, that will become three, then we will take three and we will add it to nine, becoming 12, adding six, becoming 18, eight, adding seven, becoming 25. So if you want to add all numbers in an array, reduce is the way to go. You reduce, you reduce the array from a lot of numbers until down to a single one. We'll use that as well soon. Sort, you could probably figure out what that is doing. Uh, as well. Yeah, this is a new concept since 2015 in ECMAScript 2015. And when I say, okay, so, so this is a new concept in ECMAScript 2015, you always need to be a little bit careful because the spread operator and the rest parameters, they're probably working in most browsers, I think. Let's see if it's defined in, can I use? Or I would need, ah, no, I probably need uh, to use another service for looking into ES 2015 um, uh, uh, functions and how, how they are implemented in the browser. But it could be that, okay, this will probably not work in Internet Explorer, for instance. And it might even be problematic to use it in some versions of uh, Safari, for instance. So always beware. However, when we are in Node and the latest version of Node, this is not a problem to use. Uh, and REST parameters and the spread, spread operator is quite powerful to use sometimes. Because uh, you are, okay, let, let's write instead. It's easier to, to explain. Is this good practice? We're creating a function called max that takes four values and uh, I will not write the code but kind of finds max value. Is it good practice to write code like that? No. I mean Oh, we need 10 values. Okay, add 10 more arguments to this or parameters to this list. Uh, however, there are a lot of functions in JavaScript that works kind of this way. So in the function definition, they haven't actually <coughs> written all of those uh, 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 variables, but they will act upon, or basically they want you as to, when you use the function, to send in comma separated <coughs> values to the function. Actually, max is one of those. So, so if we do a console.log, the built-in math.max, uh, and we do like one, four, six, four, three, one. This hopefully will say six, yeah, because six <coughs> is the max value. However, it's quite unusual for you to do, I mean, send in values like this. You would like to send in an, an array because y this would probably sometimes I use let, sometimes I use const. Thank you. So my control panel isn't working, and then it's so easy to forget. Uh, numbers. 
maybe it works. No, it says not the number because it's expecting an integer and it gets an array and it will just fail and say, oh, that was not the number. Uh, oh, how to do that? Well, there is some cumbersome way of using apply and call and it's <coughs> a mess. However, in ECMAScript, uh, uh, ECMAScript 2015, we could use something called a spread operator. So by adding three dots before an array, you will spread it out as arguments. And now it works. Uh, I could improvise some. If I'll ask you a question. Um, this is a stupid function, but okay. Add five to array. Return. Uh, sorry. Um, to array. What? Ah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, if I do that, then, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so push return the length of, of the new array. Uh, that wasn't <laughs> supposed to happen. So, okay, this is a really stupid uh, function. The only thing this does is to add a five to the array that is sent in. Is this a pure function? Why? What, what side effects do does it have? Yeah, so this array that is sent into the function is modified. So we are modifying something outside of, of the function itself. What would be good practice if we want this function to be pure, how would we go about doing that? Once again? Yeah, we need to copy this array and return the new array so that this array that we send in is, is not touched in any way. Then it would be nice to have like array.copy, right? Uh, but we haven't because we have no copy function. However, we have a, a splice, I think it's called, a splice function that will splice the array. And if we don't give that splice function, slice, sorry, not splice, slice, uh, slice, uh, if we, if we, don't add an argument, it will not slice the array, but it will return a copy of the array. So <laughs> this is basically a, a way of copying an array. So if we do that, so dot log numbers, we start off by logging that, then we're calling uh, uh, the function and then we log numbers again, hopefully, no, because I am not using the new array, of course. Like that, then you can see that, ah, oh, it's hard for you to see, right? Because it's so, so low down. However, if I copy the result, show it up there, then you can see that the numbers returns that one, then we return a copy of that array with a five added, and 
we haven't touched numbers. So now this function is a function without side effects. And you often want, want that result. You do not want to change the state outside of your function. But even this is quite a clumsy way of doing it because you need to remember that it's called slice. I actually think you could do, and thank you Ole, do if you're listening, something like uh, this. Using the, using, uh, the sp uh, spread operator, we're actually creating a new array and taking the old array and spreading it inside of, of the array, creating a new array. That could give the same result, but it's a neater way of, of, of doing a copy of an array, basically. Uh, questions regarding this, regarding this? Not this, but what is on the screen. Okay, so we will have a break, uh, and after the break, we will probably, yeah, we will have a look at uh, the rest parameters as, ah, well, I could just, just say, so, so you can do this the opposite way, that you can use the spread operator in another way. If you add the spread operator as the last parameter in a function declaration, uh, you will basically get all other values sent into the function. So in this case, you get name and age as the two first parameters, and then everything you add will end up in the courses array. <laughs> Not really sure why you would wa want to do something like that, but I if you want, you can. Uh, most likely, you will probably require an object containing an array of courses instead, if, if you were to do this in, in real life. But when, when it's used in this way, it's called the rest parameters not the rest operator because the rest operator is something else in javascript so rest parameters and the spread operator this is probably the more common use for for that operator okay so after the break we will move on to the concept of concept of objects and objects are really important in javascript uh, so we will have 10 minutes break okay <coughs> Okay, um, so that we have a lag of 10 seconds, that's why. Um, let's go back to uh, arrays and, and functions and things. I, I, I would actually like to address the question I got in the break. Uh, so it, if we were, it feels maybe for, for you, it feels kind of stupid to using const to declare like arrays and functions because you're quite used to that const is actually a constant uh, like a number or a string and that's it. Uh, in JavaScript it makes a little bit more sense to actually use const for other things and that's because you're able to do this in JavaScript which you probably are not able to do in other languages uh, and that is let function hello equals uh, oh sorry uh, let uh, hello equals function uh, return hello. Uh, console dot log hello. So we're calling the function. It says hello. Nothing strange there. However, what we are able to do now is do this. Actually, let make, let's make it another function. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating and declaring the function hello. Th that is a simple function returning hello. I'm logging hello, works, it says hello. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, it worked. Okay, so a function that says hello, logging hello, then I'm, um, 
reassigning hello to another function that says hey son instead. So I'm kind of overriding the first function and logging hello. And now I get a separate result. In, in, in my simple environment like this, this is probably not a big concern because I do not want to do that. And if I really want to do it, it's probably intentional and I have a good reason to do that. However, if you go to the browser environment and you start doing things like this to the built-in functions in the browser, oh, what might work well for your script if you're running your script isolated. However, in a web application today, your script is probably not isolated. Your script might be part of a framework that is part of another framework that is Im embedded in a big page with a lot of scripts running in the same time. So if you were to override a built-in function, that built-in function will be overridden for all other uh, scripts as well. And then we have a really big problem. Uh, and that is actually bad practice to do that, of course, but uh, there is nothing stopping you. But if I were to say that this is a const, we will get an exception when we try to override uh, that function. So, so it could be actually a good thing to use const uh, in, uh, in JavaScript sometimes. But you're, f you're, I mean, you're free to do whatever you like. You're even free to, to use var if, 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 if you like, but please be prepared to explain the difference between var and let. Yeah, so I will. Right? Yeah, so we will get into scope soon. Uh, so in this case, uh, if I, we will. I I I will spare that question to this afternoon because we will talk about modules and scope uh, then. So 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 I I, I will do that then, uh, and that is correct. Yeah, if you are in your own scope, you can do pretty much whatever you like. However, from inside a scope, you could always do something in the browser like Windows window dot and, and reach all window in another scope and then enhance them. And that's not a good practice to do. Okay, no, there I am. Where is my slides? Sorry. Oh, they are here somewhere. Why am I do doing that and only that? Is the stream still working? I hope it is. Okay, objects. So, you're used to Java uh, and creating objects is Java. In Java is quite a structural process. You need to create a class, some kind of blueprint of your objects, and then you instantiate objects from that blueprint or from that class. Uh, however, in JavaScript, creating an object is really simple. If I, on the examination, will ask you to create an object, the simple answer is, oh, sorry, is that. That is an object. So using curly brackets like this, without having a for loop or if statement or something like that, just using the curly brackets, that indicates create an object. But it's, what kind of object is it? What type? of object is it? It's, it's, it's nothing. It's just an object. It doesn't have a type. It's not a student object or a, a person object or mammal object or something like that. It's just an empty object. <coughs> Console.log obj. And it's... Can I do it like that maybe? Mm -hmm. Oops. That is better, right? Just an empty object. Okay. <coughs> you need a property on your object. You need a... Uh, okay, let's go with students because that is what I always do. So we need a, um, a name for the student. Object dot name equals... Johan. Yay, we have an object with a name. 
it's that simple so you could just like go ahead just attaching variables to that object okay what about methods you're used to using methods okay object dot say hello equals function uh, okay this is not a pure function but whatever hello and now we could call ob dot say hello it's a function and it says hello so you kind of are able to build your objects as you go without having a class um, this is one way of doing it another way is when you create the object you can attach properties to the object when you declare it so you could do name colon and this notation is a little bit different from what you're used to so you add name colon joan comma age colon should i say okay 41 Uh, whoops, sorry. Console log. The. Oh, uh, we write the object like that. This is actually the same as the, the input that you see here. And of course, you can add functions here as well. However, when you do it like this, you often use this kind of indention. Like that. Uh, You could use double quotations for the properties. It will change back to single quotations. <coughs> Anyone recognize this notation? JSON, yeah. So this is uh, the JSON notation. So JSON being like s simple and better XML. <laughs> Am I cursing in the shark? Uh, so, JSON, a JSON object is a JavaScript object notation. So it's kind of a JavaScript object, or it's just a nota using the JavaScript notation and creating objects. Uh, and that is what, what JSON is. Uh, we will get into that later when we start using APIs, but uh, you might be familiar with this approach. However, when you create objects in JavaScript, you often doesn't use quotes surrounding the property names. Uh, okay, with your Java knowledge, with, will this work? Um, will it work? Why? Ah, it actually did work. <laughs> <laughs> I was really unsure. Uh, so, okay, let's do it like this then. Ob.class. Will that work? Ah, damn it, it's smart. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, class is a reserved word, but since it's attached to an object, it doesn't matter. However, okay, this one. Uh, Will that work? <laughs> no, because it's red. Uh, yeah, it's just, can't have blank spaces in a, a property name like that. Uh, well, you could actually add uh, uh, um, uh, quotation marks. Oh, well, I forgot the comma as well. However, I would just look, want to show another notation. You could add properties like this as well. No. Uh, And I should have single quotes because that is the code standard. So you could use, in JavaScript, you could use single quotes or double quotes, but in the code standard that we are using, we're using single quotes. 
Whoa. Yeah. And now we have a property attend class. You probably will not do that an, a lot, but you can. This means that you can al also do things like Whoops, dynamically adding uh, dynamically adding uh, numbers, for instance, to, to uh, property names. Also not a good practice, but yeah. No, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot access uh, those uh, properties with the dot notation. You need to use this bracket notation if you do. So this is probably only if you actually receive an object from an API or something like that, and property names are, are in this matter. Then you need to use that bracket notation to, to kind of normalize them or something like that. You, you, you shouldn't do this in, I mean, I, I have seen solutions where students are adding values to an object like this. If they are supposed to ho hold like 10 values, they do this in a for loop, adding value one, two, three, four, five, six as, as properties. And that could actually make sense if you're new to programming. However, if you would like to do that, instead you would do object.values equals an array of 12 uh, numbers. So of course an object could have an array <coughs> an object could have functions. When a function is inside of an object, it's called a method. Um, however, if you're using JSON, and this is where JSON and, and uh, JavaScript objects differ. So, so when Douglas Crockford, uh, he didn't invent JSON, he discovered, he, he, this is his own words, he discovered JSON. Um, he, he kind of, I mean, if you look at XML and other standard protocols for exchanging data, you often look at, okay, if we group all languages together, what are the functions or things you can do, do in all of those languages? And then you try to add them into a big standard surrounding everything. So you could do everything in that standard. However, Crockford did it the other way around. He looked at more or less every programming language out there and he, he saw that, okay, every programming language can actually handle numbers. Being integers or floats or whatever, how, but they can handle numbers. So he added numbers, he added strings, he added objects, arrays, booleans, maybe I forget something, but more or less that. And that's all there is to it. So. The JSON notation is really simple. You can, for instance, not add functions to JSON, but in JavaScript you can have functions, but you cannot add functions to JSON. Um, but we will get into JSON later on. Uh, in this case, when we're using objects in JavaScript, you can add functions and then they are called methods. <coughs> Okie doke. I think I have said, yeah, no, uh, let's do that actually. Uh, greet, we're adding a function called greet, which are supposed to console dot log something and says, hello. Of course, I would like this function to to, to say, in this case, U1 says hello. What should I write there to be able to do that? Suggestions. How will I reference that property, you think? This, this dot, yeah. So it could look quite obvious if you're from Java that you are supposed to use this inside of an object and you will reference the instance of that object. It's not that simple in JavaScript. This is really tricky. It's actually, this is actually this 
is actually one of the things that got a little bit wrong Brendan Eich when he created JavaScript back in 95. Uh, arrow functions are kind of fixing this, but yeah, we'll have a look at that later. So if I do this, no, sorry, we need to call dot greet. So this object's greets. Uh, oh, sorry, better to return, I think. So that is a pure function. Johan says hello. Good. Any other suggestions? I mean, this works. Could we do it in another way? You could actually do it like this. Obj.name. And there is actually a lot of things going on when I do it like that. I think I talked about closures when I introduced functions. And you have this concept of an inner function, if, if it can't find a, a, a variable inside of a function, it will go to its, its outer scope to look, at, look for that object or that variable. So in this case, when this function is being called down here, it will try to find the ob variable inside of that function, but it's not there. Then it will go to its outer scope using closures. So the outer scope will be accessible even though this code could have been returned long ago when we call that greet function. So it will look at its outer scope and it will find an object variable. And it will use that object variable to find a name since writing the correct name. I'm not saying that this is a good way of doing this. Of course, this is better because if I rename that object, that will not work anymore. So you shouldn't really be depend inside of an object. You shouldn't be dependent on what the callee is called. So this is better. <coughs> uh, once again yeah uh, so that's a good question so if we only write name in this case uh, node app.js I think it will say undefined no it actually crashed uh, name is not defined however if I were to do this John says hello. So, so what it's doing, it's the same thing. It, it looks for a name inside of this function. It can't find it. It will look in the scope outside and it will fun find a, fun uh, uh, a variable called name and then it will insert and use that value. But you will not be able to reference the object's uh, 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 properties that way. Uh, okay, this. I said that this is the concept of this is a little bit tricky. So the this is not referring to the instance of this object. This is res referring to the object that is calling the function. So if we look at this line in the console.log, the callee of the function, the, 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 the object that is calling the greet function in this case is the ob object. Ah, sorry. So that object is calling greet, then this will refer to that object. Yeah, you, I, I, let's do this. If I create a new object, new object, I'm really having a lot of fantasies. Or, or, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, new object, name, colon, kale, like that. Uh, and then, 
Okay, of course I can't do this because the greet method isn't available on the new object, right? So it will crash. However, I could call this function, I could borrow the greet function from the object but call it with this pointing to another object. So if I do this, ob.greet.call uh, and refer to the new object, I think it's call. Ooh, let's see. I will explain. Yeah. So what I'm doing here is I, I'm saying I want to borrow the greet function. So call the greet function, but instead of calling it with ob as the call e, I, I'm telling it to, to, to use the new object as the reference for this. So when we execute this function, the greet function, this is referring to the new object, hence it says Kalle says hello. So you could modify what this is referring to inside of functions. Yeah, so this is kind of the introduction to functional programming. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and this is kind of, I will get into this more after lunch, but there is a concept of comp composition over inheritance. So you're probably quite familiar with doing inheritance change. So we have animals and mammals are an inheriting from animals and cows are inheriting from mammals. And you can get this inheritance shame. Composition on the other hand is, is kind of doing, okay, so I would like to create an animal. I would create a cow. What does a cow need? Oh, it needs four legs. Then I borrow four legs from another animal. And then I borrow uh, a head from a third. So you can compose a new object using existing objects. Uh, by doing this, for instance. However, this is, uh, I did this in the wrong order, I'm sorry, but doesn't matter. S so you can do it like this. However, we could also do it like this which is probably would what you would do in the normal case. So we are creating this new object and I want this new object to have a greet method as well. But I, I do not want it to be named greet. I would like, I would like it to be called say hello instead. So I could, of course, I could create a new function, say hello, which kind of copies this code. But since someone else has already written this code, and I do not want to do that again, I could just say that, okay, take this object greet method and assign the reference to greet to my say hello. So this function is on the heap in the memory and the object.greet is pointing to that, referencing that function. By doing the, this row, 11, we're also saying that the say hello reference should reference the same function. So say hello is referencing this function and greet is referencing that function. Both are pointing to the same function declaration. And now we could do, do new object, oops, new object dot say hello, run it, and it says Kalle says hello. And that is because now say hello is called with new object as the callee. So this will refer to new object in that case, but when we call it like we did on the object, it will refer to the object instead. Are you following along? Yeah. So, and, and this is really neat. If you need to borrow a function, for instance, say that you're implementing an own data, your own data structure. It's kind of like an array, but not really. You want some other properties, so you call it arrayish. So you create your object arrayish, and then you say that, oh, I would like to have a length property. Oh, well, copy the length property then. Or copy the slice method, because you like the slice method, how it's implemented in, in an array. But you could also 
kind of implement functions from other types that you, you like and, and kind of build your own object. Uh, and this is quite powerful. Uh, of course, it could be dangerous as well if you use this on the built-in types and, and start to altering them and enhancing the, the built-in array object. You could, could do that. You could say that. Um, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself maybe, but whatever. Uh, say that you have... Oh, well, let's, let's actually, let's try something. Let's r equals one, so we're creating a simple array, okay? An array is just an object. I haven't tried this. Um, Um, maybe. Uh, uh, I'm not sure this will work, actually. Uh, there is another way of doing it. But oh, well. Ah, it's adding, <laughs> it's adding it as a, uh, actually, into the... Um, okay. So... Let's try this. This is actually after the break. Wait. Uh, don't mind the prototype and the array thing. We will explain that after the break. But what I'm doing here is I'm actually enhancing the built-in array method. So I'm enhancing the array, uh, array type so that it gets a new function called get first number that always refers, uh, returns the first number in the array. And the neat thing is, let our two equals hello cool blah uh, console dot log uh, r2 dot uh, get first number strange to have it called get first number get first element would be better so I, I actually altered the built-in array type so all other scripts running in this environment will have the get first number method and in the browser this is quite dangerous. It's quite usual that you do this with a special type in, 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 uh, in the browser called <coughs> uh, uh, node list because the node list is all nodes in the HTML DOM tree uh, and it doesn't have a for each, for instance. And then you want to add a for each, so you write your own for each or borrow the arrays for each and, and uh, adds it to uh, uh, the node list. However, the problem is when the browser starts natively support that function, then you override it with probably worse code. So you're overriding a built-in function and then it becomes tricky. So you shouldn't do things like this, but it, but it shows how, what you can do in the language. If array was your own type, then it's totally fine, of course, to, 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 to add functions to your own types, but you shouldn't alter the built-in types, even if you can. I will explain this prototype thing soon. Okay, where were we? Objects. I think we've gone through all of that. Yeah. So, before lunch, I will show this example. Uh, it's kind of showing off how you can use those new reduce map uh, functions on arrays containing objects. Uh, this one is, as I'm writing on the slide, heavily influenced, I would even call it stolen by MPGA. Uh, uh, I would uh, urge you all to, to actually look at his example as well. You have it in the slides. If you're, if you're into programming JavaScript uh, and want to become a part of the community, you should actually follow MPGA on, on YouTube. Uh, he's a Swedish 
a developer that started that channel kind of like four, sh four years ago, something like that. Uh, if you have been to Nordic.js or in the Swedish JavaScript scene, you probably know MPJ. Uh, he works with Spotify, I think he's his own consultant right now. Uh, he has a lot of good, high quality videos, uh, not only concerning JavaScript, other videos as well, but I recommend watching them. Uh, they have quite a good production value as well. Well, not enough with the commercial for, for MPJ. Uh, so in this case, we have an array of courses. This is, this is kind of typically what you will get from an API. So you are calling an API to get all registered students on a course or get in this case all courses on computer science department at the university and you will get this back. It will probably quite be quite a bit longer, but uh, this is an example. And often those are start off with an array. So this is an array of objects. So we have four objects in, in the array and each object containing the course code, the number of students taking the course, what type of course it is and the URL to the course and probably a lot of other things as well. Your job is to get all count this number of students taking a distance course which has GitHub as the URL. So you need to find how many students are taking uh, distance courses using GitHub, basically. How would you go about doing that in Java or any other language that you know? What, what would be, how would you approach that problem? Make a for loop, uh, loop over all objects, make some if statements, test if, okay, uh, filter every type that is distance and when the URL is that, then you save those to a temporary, uh, temporary um, array and then you add all the numbers up in another for loop or something like that. Might be hard to do it all at once in one for loop maybe. Uh, no, it will not be actually. You will just add the students. But okay, so you will use some kind of for loop. Uh, will probably be easier in this case, but I will show it anyway. Uh, so we copy this one. And I will do this using only um, using only the built-in uh, filter, reduce, map, and so on methods. Uh, so first of all, I will use a filter. So courses uh, dot filter. Remember, courses is an array and it has the filter method. And this is a higher order function that will take another function as uh, a parameter or argument in this case. Um, uh, yeah, so it complains on something. Not sure what it says. It's the code standard, so I don't think it's an uh, consistent spacing. So I'm not sure why it's not fixing it when I'm saving. It should, but ah, whatever. Uh, so I take one course, send it to an error function. Uh, and what filter will do is that it will, for each, I said this before, but if I return true, it will build a new array with each and every element that I return true on. And I will return true if the type uh, courses course dot type is distance. Uh, 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 yeah, so so I'm I'm starting off with just distance. Uh, in this case, console log distance courses. <laughs> Where did my. Damn it. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. I get three courses and all of those are distance courses. So I've filtered out 
the campus course in this case. Of course, I could I could add some where this distance and uh, and this do a substring, but I will do this in steps instead, and I have a reason why I do that. And uh, now I will do git hub distance courses equals distance courses, and we do a new filter, uh, and we will do that filter on uh, the course dot URL. Let's find GitHub courses uh, dot substring. Just a simple substring. I start at the first character, then I count one to nineteen. Counts fast, uh, and that uh, should equal. Uh, https colon slash slash github dot com slash that could be important if you have a subdomain starting with dot com but that's quite unlikely but anyways uh, github distance courses bam uh, that didn't work because I probably counted wrong one zero one Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-twenty-two, forty-twenty-three, forty-twenty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-twenty-two, forty-twenty-three, forty-twenty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-twenty-two, forty-twenty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty-fifteen, forty-sixteen, forty-seventeen, forty-eighteen, forty-nineteen, forty-twenty, forty-twenty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-ten, forty-eleven, forty-twelve, forty-thirteen, forty-fourteen, forty
calculate it all at the same time because the only thing we are doing is that we are taking and saving it in temporary variables you do not need to do that you can do it like this you can chain the functions together ah. and that one ah. still works but this if we close that one this is quite a neat way of reading it actually so so now it's quite easy to read as well so okay let's get the total by taking the courses and filter a course according to the course type distance and then filter the course once again for all course urls that equals that one and we are interested in course students, so we map students and we reduce the students by doing a s s uh, uh, addition and then we write the total. So actually this code is, when, when it gets complex and you have complex objects to work with, this code is quite easy to read actually. Yep? Uh, no, because uh, uh, I need to, if I were just to, to do like that, uh, I would test it on uh, the whole string. And I will just want to check if that part of the string, the first 19 characters, is containing github.com. Of course, you could use a regular expression if you... If you Regular expressions is probably making more sense in this case to um, instead of using substring, but I've said it before if you have if, if you're using if, if you have a problem and solve it by using regular expressions You have two problems and that is kind of my take of regular expressions. I I, oh, I always mess things up when I'm using uh, regex Yeah Uh, yeah, probably you could, yeah, contain might. I'm not sure if there is a function called that, but then you are probably in the regular expression territory. Uh, you have compare and you have match, and uh, so so you could use the match regular expression and adding this one inside, and it will return true if it's found. So fine, you can use as well. I think this is just an example. There are simpler ways of doing that one. Um, okay, it's lunch. Um, we will meet after lunch and we will start discuss. Oh, sh I'm not halfway. <laughs> we, yeah, but second part is faster, I think. Uh, we will start discussing how to create or mimic classes in JavaScript and then we will get to some familiar code for you, I think. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Welcome back. Um, so, uh, we will uh, start looking at uh, creating, like, or mimicking classes that you're used to from other languages. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the reason why we... Whoa, sorry. Um, yeah, good thing it's not streaming. Duh, duh, duh. Let's do it like, or oh, was it the correct one? Mm -mm -mm. That one. Okay. Mixed. Like that. No. That does not work at all. It does. It's just laggy. Strange. Okay. But it started showing things I didn't break. Strange. Now I think it's. No. 
no. Okay, if I do that. looks like that <laughs> um, give me a minute <laughs> that is really strange behavior I will just restart this. <coughs> well, now I actually think it works. So, where were I? Uh, back to that one. You have to do without me on camera. Um, yeah, so uh, you are supposed to create student objects. We need one object for a, each and every student in a course, for instance. You could do something like this. Students, let students create an empty array. Uh, and then we do a students.push. Uh, we add an empty object with a name. Uh, Uh, and an ID something like that okay that is um, Perfect. We have an array with a student. Then we need to add another student. So of course we could do something like this. We get two students. This is quite a trivial example because we only have two properties and no methods and, and, and things like that. However, if we were supposed to, I mean, create a lot of students, this approach is quite error prone because, I mean, if we do something like we forget ourselves, so we do something like that. Now we have objects in this array with different uh, properties for their student ID. So, so this will be quite hard to handle in the next step when we might depend on that student ID. Um, so doing it like this is not a good way if we are supposed to create a lot of objects which are supposed to, to be the same, uh, have the same blueprint. This is where you have used classes of course in, in, in Java. You create a blueprint for for students and, and then you just instantiate objects. Uh, there are several different ways to mimic that in JavaScript and we will start from, from a simple solution and work ourselves all the way up to, to talking about prototypes for instance. Uh, one way of doing this is use something called the factory pattern. Uh, have you heard of the factory pattern? The factory pattern can be used in other uh, uh, <coughs> circumstances as well. It's just that, okay, so instead of creating each and every object uh, separately, we could add a factory or create a factory that creates objects for us. Uh, so let's do that. I would copy this code. It's faster than I write everything. Do, 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 do. <coughs> uh, okay, we create a function called createStudent that 
takes two parameters, name and age. And it returns an object. This is an object that is returned. We return an object with a name mapped to that name. We can do this if we like. It's quite common to have private members of a function with an underscore in the beginning. Uh, then you can see the mapping more clear. Uh, we add a greet method because we need a greet method in this uh, example. And then I could create uh, an array of students and then, then I push in uh, uh, the result of create student ln30, which is an object and create student Peter. So this will more or less create the same thing. Uh, oh, well, then I, for each student, I call student.greet. And then you see that Ellen is greeting you and Peter is greeting you. Uh, we could actually make this even neater by removing this one again. This is also a syntax sugar that if you have a property in a object, you can map that property name to a parameter in, in the, the, the function without the need of doing that. So in this case, we could actually do it like this. It's the same thing. We create a new object with those matched, the, the, the parameters to the function mapped with the object uh, properties. We run it and it works. Okay, let's start to talk about a little bit about optimization. Do you see a problem with this approach? A lot of function copies. That's correct. This greet method, it's simple in this case, but I mean this could be more complex. For each and every object created, it gets its own greet uh, uh, function. So on the heap there will be, if we create a thousand students, there will be a, a thousand greet methods on the heap. If the JavaScript compiler doesn't do a lot of magic in the background and optimize the things for you, probably can do that, but it's not, we can't be sure of that. <coughs> okay, how, question, how could we still have a greet method in each and every object created, but without Du duplicating it in the memory. Outside, yeah, create it outside of the function and create it as a reference. So I move this one, or so we have a greet greet variable and then we could just do a greet because this one will try to map against that one. Uh, run it, still works. However, when this file is loaded, this one is uh, added to the memory and for each and every object that we instantiate, it's not the right word, for each and every object we create, the greet uh, refer will reference this function in the memory. So now we have optimized it a bit. Um, the, uh, I tend to use the factory pattern sometimes because it's uh, often you, you just want to create a simple configuration object that you are supposed to use in, in, in certain circumstances and creating a factory is quite, uh, quite an easy way to create those objects without you risking to duplicate stuff in, in, in the wrong uh, way. Um, but there are other ways of doing this as well. But you should, be, you should know that this is called a factory uh, pattern and what it is and how you could utilize it. Questions on the factory pattern? It's quite simple actually. Okay, uh, let's move on. This is probably where you know, right? The constructor pattern. So in, uh, uh, in uh, languages with classes, you have a constructor. Uh, uh, we have that in JavaScript as well from, from the beginning, but doesn't work like classes do. 
So let's copy this example. It's the same one with the students. That. First of all, we, we create a function called student. You could do it that, like this, or of course I could make it the opposite way around by doing let student, const student equals function, if I like. Uh, but in this case I did it this way. Anything you can notice about the function declaration? Yeah, there is a capital S. Uh, and that is the same thing in Java. If you create a class in Java, you always capitalize uh, uh, the class name. Uh, this is a convention in JavaScript that if you are creating a constructor, you are using a capitalized first letter. It's just a convention, but everybody tend to, to, to follow it. Please do. Do not have this uh, uh, with a small s like that. Capitalize it. Uh, Okay, so this tells us that this is some. This is not the usual function. This is a constructor function, a function that is used to create instances of objects. It's still just a regular function, but a constructor function is supposed to be called with new instead of a regular function. Uh, uh, be called as a regular function. So in this case, we are supposed to call this function using the keyword new, like that. And then send in whatever we like, just as I did on this row. So if you call a function using the new keyword, you're telling that function that it, instead of returning undefined, if you don't return anything, this function will return a reference to a new instance of itself, more or less. So when we call it like this, this is returning, return this will be done even if we don't write it. So often when you're creating a, a constructor function, you just make sure you don't return anything <coughs> because then return this is uh, returned or this is returned. Uh, so what I do in this case is, since this is returned and this being the new instance, I could operate upon this inside of the function. So by doing line two, this dot name equals name, I'm assigning a property to the instance and I'm connecting it to that parameter. The same thing with h and the same thing with greet in this case. This is being called a method, and the, those are properties. Yep. This name is by name, but this the second name, what is it variable? Yeah. So, so it should be like a global field. No, this one is this one, and that age is that age. Yeah. Yeah. So they match, and this name is the one, the property that will be attached to the object returned. So you can almost look at the, this constructor pattern as a factory that creates new objects. Mm. You reference that object that will be returned by the this uh, operator. So this dot name will create a new uh, instance on that object. So, no, I mean, like in, in Java, you know, you know <coughs> this, this name is by name, you could have a key to yeah, okay. So, so yeah, um, we, we will get to like getters and setters and fields and, and stuff later. But not yet. We're not that yet. there yet. Um, so, just remember, capitalized function name, you're supposed to call it by new. I could, of course, call this without new. However, then not undefined is returned and it will not work. This, this name, you know, but this name, which name? There is no variable called name to, to assign it to the parameter. Uh, well, 
That is the thing with JavaScript. You don't need to, uh, to have it from the beginning. You could always just create it on the go. So what I do in this line is, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, this is an empty object from the start. So th this is referring to empty object. And what I do on this line is that I say that, okay, take this empty object and attach a property name to that empty object, that being uh, that parameter. So you can dynamically create those properties as you go. But of course, I could do this in other ways. I, I mean, I could do, do it like that if I like. And add, um, uh, add the parameter in that way. But you, as, as you don't need to have the class declaration where you have told the compiler which properties are available. You could create those properties as you go. Okay, hmm, we're back to that problem, right? So for every instance of this object, we're yet again creating <coughs> a new <coughs> function. When using constructor functions, there is another way of, of putting, or another way you can put uh, methods on, on the object, and that is called uh, the prototype. Uh, I think we will have a picture on that one, hope. Yeah. Uh, so this being called the constructor prototype pattern. Uh, and I will explain this with an image soon. We will just have a look of what we do first. So I remove this uh, 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 greet property or method from within the constructor function and places it outside. Then I do a student.prototype greet equals function. What this is, I, you, you saw me do this with arrays before. So this constructor function has something called a prototype. On that prototype, uh, which is an object that will be common for all instances of this constructor, we could place this greet method. Then all, pro all objects created from this prototype will, or from this constructor, will share the same greet method. Uh, just making sure it will work, and it does. And I'm logging something else, yeah. Uh, so let's have a look at um, what this is then. So when I create instances of objects, they all have a constructor function. And we can reach that constructor function by, if I go back to this, no. Ah, help. I had you done there. Ah, I didn't say this before. Let's get them one, that one back. What I do here is that I say that, okay, take the first student and dot constructor. So dot constructor on an object created with a uh, constructor pat pattern will get you a reference back to the function creating the object. So that's just a reference back to the constructor. Uh, so if you're uncertain which function is the constructor, you can always use that, but you probably never will. However, so looking at this picture, we have a constructor uh, property that points to, to the constructor function. But we also have something called a prototype. And so these are the instances that we created from this constructor function, but they will get a hidden reference back to its prototype. The prototype being another object, which is common for all, which is in common for all of those uh, instances created. And what I did when I removed the greet method from each instance and moved it to the student.prototype, I placed it up here. Now, if we 
try to do student zero dot greet, it will look in this uh, uh, property list and try to find the greet method. If it doesn't find the greet method, it will follow the prototype reference back to its prototype and in this case it will find greet there and it will run it. But it will run it with this referring to that instance. So if I'm using this inside of greet, it will return to that object. And for this object it's the same, this will re uh, refer to that object. This is kind of similar how, how the scope works for uh, variables in the function that it goes to it, its outer scope. In this case it goes to its prototype. And this is starting to look kind of like inheritance, right? I mean you have something up here that those inherit so they could share functions for instance, functionality. And actually you can do something called prototype inheritance or in JavaScript we have something called prototype inheritance. And that is basically you creating an object and assigning the prototype reference to that object and then you may made an inheritance. And you could, I mean, you could do that in a chain if you like. This is actually quite different from how JavaScript, Java is created in the background. It, it's nothing like this. In Java you have the classes and things. In JavaScript you have the prototypes. But you can use this to kind of mimic the way Java works if you like. Um, this prototype reference you never ever more or less use it. Um, it's hidden in the browser, you can access it but you probably never should because that is automatic. However you can reference the prototype uh, uh, property on constructor functions. And that is what I did here. Uh, I I referenced the, the constructor function dot prototype and then I reached that prototype and then I, I connected a greet method on that prototype. You could do uh, you could add a primitive data type to the prototype as well. However, so if we look at that image, now I have a student, number of students uh, int on this one, the prototype. If I try to read that one, it will follow the prototype chain and it will read 32 or whatever I wrote. However, if you try to modify that integer or number that you stored on the prototype, it will actually make a copy of that int and place it on the instance and increase that one. S so this one will stay the same. Um, just a good thing to know that primitive uh, data types are handled that way uh, instead. Oh well, I get reference types are handled the same way as well because you will probably copy the reference to the instance if you try to, to alter uh, greet for instance in, a, in this case. Um, yeah, uh, good news. What I'm telling you now you should like have some kind of understanding about. However, we will get, get you to a point, y you will not need to do this if you don't like. Uh, we will get to something, a newer syntax, but I'm just showing what leads up to that syntax. Uh, we can do something called prototype chaining or prototype prototypal inheritance. Um, let's open Slack, I forgot. Ooh, yeah. um, so I've created a person 
it has a name nn and h17 and a greet function so this is yet again a simple simple object uh, and then i use that object person to create new instances using a function called object.create uh, this is another way of creating uh, creating objects I'm, I'm basically saying okay i have object i want to create a new object and as the first argument i will tell uh, which prototype to use for that object so i create a new object with person as the prototype so basically you can say that student inherited person in this case because no uh, student dot greet and then says hi but student if we I think at least if we do a If I log the student object, it's empty. It's completely empty. It's just an empty object. But still, if it still has properties like greet and age, and that is because those properties are on student's prototype object. So. As you probably have seen, if I do this, create an empty object, <coughs> new object dot, oh well that's not representative, uh, we can do this, console dot log, hope this works. I console log the new object. Yeah, it's empty. But it, I mean, this didn't crash. New object seems to have a function called to string, but it's empty. How could it have a two-string? Yeah, it's the same thing. The, an empty object has a prototype that has a two-string method. In this case, the two-string method kind of just says that it's an object. But, so even if the object seems empty, it has its, its prototype and you can call objects on, uh, 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 arguments on the prototype, or blah, 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 properties on the, the prototype. Okay, prototype inheritance. And of course you can do this in the chain. I could let uh, pupil, is it called that? Is that the Yeah. yeah. Uh, equals object dot create student. So that is some kind of other student and then we could, yeah, so, so, so in this case, Pupil is a student that is a person. So, so you're kind of making a chain of uh, uh, prototypes. And then you could have different uh, uh, methods on the different uh, objects. And you could, of course, overwrite greet in a pupil. So, so the pupil will say greet in one way, the student in another, and uh, person in a third way. So this is kind of like inheritance that you're used to. But it's called proto prototype inheritance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, you can only have one prototype. Yes, you cannot do multiple inheritance. However, remember in JavaScript, you can compose new objects. So you could basically take one object, take what you need from that object, take another object and what you need from that object, create a new object and use that as a prototype. And then you will kind of get multiple inheritance even though you have designed, decided with what to borrow from which function. <coughs> uh, 
Okay. Someone's always asking, and I think you might have asked this already. I'm, I'm, I don't remember, but if we let's uh, boop, 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 boop. I want to go back. Uh, yeah. Okay, so going back to this example. In Java, you have private properties, you have public properties, you have protect no protected properties, uh, and so on. We don't have that in JavaScript. We only have, I mean, you ha you have never seen the keyword public or private or protected. We're just creating variables, and if we are using this, they become public, and if we are not using this, they are private. So the student has a private variable, it's assigned to 10, and this variable is, you're not able to access this from outside. Yeah? So if they do not like a private variable in Java, then they would be able to access it from within the big bank, right? Yeah, um, that, that is my point. Uh, so, so the problem now with this private variable is that the public method greet is not able to access the private property private variable, if we should compare this to Java. But it's quite obvious in this case, because I mean that variable is, is inside of that function, and greet has no access to that function. It has access to this, ob the, this object. Uh, so Douglas Crockford made an attempt of, of creating its own kind of termol th 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 terminology, thank you, uh, surrounding this, calling uh, this a private uh, a public uh, method. If you do it like this, assign it inside and duplicating it, he called it a privileged method. A <coughs> privileged method would be able to have access to the private properties because it's inside of the function. But with the uh, drawback that it's duplicated in memory. Uh, don't think about it too much. Uh, I think in, in, in JavaScript in general, you're not so concerned about leaking uh, private data from a function that, uh, as you are in, in for instance, Java. Uh, at least that is my uh, experience uh, with this that often you don't care that much. You kind of use the notation of the underscore when something is supposed to be private and other developers respect that, okay, I probably shouldn't do something with this variable. Um, could even be easier to test in some cases when things are public. Um, but yeah, we will get to another way of looking at this. Uh, so, I think this is what I'm explaining here. Yeah. Uh, one way of, we will get into this with getters and setters and what's it called in Java? It's called, you said it I think. Uh, not all at once, one. Oh, you say getters and setters, but you have fields and stuff, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not used to the Java terminology, so, uh, but l have a look at this. So this is, I mean, if you're just supposed to use the constructor pattern and create getters and setters, you would probably do it something like this. You create a function student, it has a name. You have a this.setName, so you create a public method called setName, which is a function that takes a pair of the name and assigns it to uh, that, uh, <laughs> that private. This is 
kind of weird actually it's not it's really not weird but it's you need to understand one thing that we talked about before that is in the, the scope of the function will will look at that name if it doesn't find a name inside of that function so in this case if we send in a name it will be assigned this name will be assigned that name that we send in to set the, set the setter and the same thing together will return that name from this this private variable name will be returned with get name and then we call set name because if you create uh, uh, object student and send in a name we want the setter to be run in this case it doesn't matter because it doesn't do anything but normally in a in a setter you will have some kind of validation of the name and we will make sure that the name called with the constructor is also uh, run through set this works uh, now you can from this greet method you can access the name by get name uh, you can create new students and the students can greet so, so this works perfectly fine however it's it's not that beautiful I mean you have this dot set name you need to duplicate the the property name using a set and but it works and it's perfectly fine to do it this way however no oh, said however uh, we have something called define property and this is probably a little bit more like you're used to uh, so define property on an object like this so you, you call object out define property as the first parameter you, the argument you say which object are am I supposed to create the property on in this case it's this because we're inside of the constructor function then you set the property name to name in this case and then you send in an object with uh, uh, configuration of this uh, uh, property and in this case there is a get method so so we are setting a get and a set uh, those are predefined uh, and we tell what to do when we get something well return the name what to do when we set something well in this case I'm just adding some brackets yep yeah. Yeah. Uh, if if we steal a, uh, a function from another object, then the private variables will still be. Yeah, yeah. They will. Because you will get a. Uh, oh well, if you do it with. Oh. if you do it with this one where you have the, the in this case you would borrow greet uh, so you will add greet to another function uh, another object sorry and then when that object calls its greet this will refer to that object so in that case that object needs the get name uh, setter because that is a uh, getter because that is uh, on, on, on this and this is is referring to the new object you have so then you need to duplicate those as well because this one is dependent on uh, the object having a get name um. Okay, so what this does, this is just a fancy way of creating a getter setter. The good thing is that when we use this one, uh, we don't need to call a function. We could just uh, student zero dot name equals like that. So I changed from Peter to Johan it crashes unterminated temperature for each oh sorry yeah okay so instead of calling 
set name, we could just call the property. But as you can see, name will run its setter and do that validation. That is kind of like Java, right? Or C sharp at least. I know you do it like kind of this in C sharp. Uh, the syntax is probably different. However, if you want to read up on something, you can read up on define property because you can use define property to fine tune properties. You can freeze them, for instance, that being that will have a value it can never change. Uh, you can uh, read only, uh, well, in this case, if we remove the setter, it's read only. So you can only get, you can not set the value. You can do a lot of things with define property to fine tune how a property on an object should behave, if you like. Okay, let's move forward. Yoohoo! Now you should be happy because you will probably recognize this. So, putting it all together, uh, the standard committee consisting, consisting of amongst others, uh, uh, earlier named uh, uh, Douglas Crockford, they uh, discussed for a very long time if classes should be something that was implemented in JavaScript. Uh, and this is something that is truly dividing the community. There are, s you will find JavaScript developers that will not touch classes at all, that just opposes, says that classes is for other languages, it has nothing to do with JavaScript, and you will find others that will like embrace them and use them because they are used to using classes. Uh, I, I will not take, take standing which side I'm on, I'm kind of in the middle. However, knowing what you're supposed to do in the rest of the course, and how the browsers are working with something called uh, custom elements in the browser to create own custom HTML elements. Uh, I know that the class syntax is quite powerful in that context. So I would actually recommend, especially for you with a Java background, that you kind of use the class syntax. Uh, the class syntax is actually only an easier way of writing everything that we've learned so far. Define properties and uh, uh, prototype uh, uh, properties and all of this is just a prettier syntax for doing all of those stuff. I think I've, I've written some comments here. So first of all, we use the keyword class. Good thing that was reserved <laughs> in, in the language. So we have class and we call it student. So far, so good. Then inside of the curly brackets, if we just want to show this. Okay, if you look at this code, I will not copy it into the uh, uh, ID, but if you look at this one, you have the function, the student constructor here. It starts here, it ends here. Then outside of that constructor function, we define the student, uh, the greet method. I have a lot of students that find this quite strange, so they move this declaration inside of the constructor function, and it will work. However, the, the, the thing with that is that for each and every object created, this greet method will be reassigned. So it will, it will not create duplicates, but it will kind of create that method over and over and over again. But they tend to do that because they are so used to having a class starting here and ending at the bottom and everything in between is the class. But it's not, that's not the way to do it when you work with constructor functions. But however, the class syntax does this. So, so it has a curly bracket up here and it ends here. And everything in between is things concerning this type or class. I shouldn't say class, it, it's not true, truly a class. It's still called a type, kind of, but you could look at it as a class. So, okay, inside of this uh, student class, we have a constructor. So that is the constructor being called when we run new. So if we do new student, 
this construct here is being called. It's kind of like PHP, I think. They have this notation as well. Uh, then I do a this.name. Uh, this will call the setter. And getters and setters are defined like that. You just write get name or set name. What happens in the background is that defined property is being used, like we saw in the last uh, slide. But this is a much easier way of writing it. So we have a getter, we have a setter, and we have a greet method. And if you just add a method name like that, that will be a prototype function. So you don't need to write student.prototype. It's, it's done in the background. However, when you run this, it's exactly the same as we have done in the, in the last example. It's just a better syntax, I think at least. However, if you're really into pr working with the prototype, you will probably hate this syntax. You're allowed to do whatever you like. Uh, no, that is wrong. No, uh, it's not. I've, let's see. Why do I have an underscore on that one? It's this. Let's see if that works. Um, Yeah, I would probably, but yep. I've prob yeah, I gotta get a circular reference in this case because when I do this dot name, this setter is called once again and once again and once again. So we will get a circular uh, expression. And in this case, so so underscore name in this case is just a way of storing the name value uh, uh, underneath the hood. No, but this underscore name, which variable, or what's the that? Uh, so yeah, so that will there be... no variable here to store value in. Uh, it, we are just creating it, just as, as the last time. We're creating it on, on this object. Uh, to be able to store, because if I if we have this get name and this set name, and this is the public interface, so we want this property to be called name outside of the function. However, if we were to use the same name here, we will get a name collision on those. So instead, I'm saving this uh, inside of my object with another name. No. Yeah, if, if, the, if the syntax isn't logical, you could always fall back to, to I mean, it's the same thing as, as, no, wrong way. It's the same thing as this one. Uh, however, It's like if, I guess that one would be named name underscore name instead. Yeah. Yeah, it's completely different than C. And this is the thing. I mean, uh, C++, C, Java, they, they are all kind of the same language, C sharp. They, they come from the same language tree. JavaScript has borrowed a lot of the aesthetics, how, how it looks and how it feels from that tree. However, it stems from a to totally different tree with scheme and the Lisp and things. So, so under the hood, it's completely different. And that's why the logic will be kind of backwards uh, in some cases. But this is still 
that is that is just to, to memorize this model more or less. So you look at this model when you want to do something, uh, if you want to use a class, li like a class. Because instead of doing the prototype inheritance, you can now do things like this. Class polygon has a constructor with a height and a width. And then we create a class square that extends polygon, uh, which has a side length, which calls super and super being that class constructor. So this is probably quite familiar if, you, if you're used to classes in Java. Uh, under the hood, a lot of object.create with prototypes are involved. But this is just another interface for the developer. And that is the thing with JavaScript that you not must know that JavaScript is this kind of Lego for programmers. I mean, you can do things in so many different ways. There is not just one way to, to create an object. I've probably shown like <coughs> 10 different ways of creating objects in JavaScript. I mean, you could get away with always using classes if you like and always creating objects from classes. That's totally fine. However, it will be really be overkilling some, some tasks that you do with JavaScript sometimes. Sometimes you just want a simple object and send that simple object to a function. And then creating a class and, and blah, da, 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 when you just can do brackets, name, colon, something. It's kind of overkilling it, but you could if you like. Um, Yeah, I've kind of talked about this already. Um, what does this do? Oh my god, I haven't read up upon this. Object design, oh my god. Let's see what it does. Probably need to help each other on this one. Um, So looks like we have a student uh, that is a factory. Yeah, oh, uh, this is, oh, I, I think I talked about this in the recording, right? Uh, you could have default parameters in JavaScript. You couldn't before, but you can now. So this is, I mean, this is an arrow function. So this is a function declaration with a name and an H and name being N and an H being default to 18 if we don't uh, add anything else. So this is a factory that is returning uh, a new object which are using a sign to, oh, I almost don't know what the sign does, but it's using a sign supervisor. I need to nah, forget about that one. I'm not sure why I had it there. I don't know it myself. But it's probably a way of doing composition in a fancy way. Uh, so we have a student Niels, a student Ellen, Elsa.s supervises uh, that one. So we are send, okay. Uh, so supervise. So this is kind of telling uh, that this student will supervise that student. So we're sending that student to supervise. Uh, I can't do it now. Uh, let's talk about modules instead, because that I know. Uh, uh, when we are writing an application in, uh, in Node, if I'm logging this, I'm just logging this inside of a file that is run with node. And we see this is an empty object. So when I'm writing programs in, in node like this, my file is a scope or it's its own, its own object. However, if we start to transition to the browser, uh, 
Uh, I mean, you could, oops. Oh, you can't, okay. Clear. Uh, let's make it bigger. If I try the same thing in the browser, you will see that this refers to something called a window. And if we look at window, you will see an object with a lot of methods and properties. And this is basically the whole web browser window or instance or tab in this case. So you can like, ac I can access everything on the page, I can access the URL, I can change a lot of things with this. So when we are writing code for the browser, we are in this environment where we have a lot of public things that we could mess up if we are not careful. And this is the environment we will be coding in starting next week. And if I am to do something simple in this environment, if I do uh, let hello equals 10, pretty, I mean, this is just, think of this as being in a file. I'm just assigning the hello variable. Then, soul.log window.hello. Didn't work, damn it. They might have changed something as well. Yeah, it is. And that was the point. I can't see it. This this might be up for change because ah sorry I should have used uh, yeah. Uh, ah, it's strange that it didn't do it actually. Just I'm just trying this then. Uh. Oh, okay. This is good programming. Uh, um, hmm. Oh, well, didn't prove my point, but <laughs> my point was this, that when you're, we will see this next week, but when we are creating variables just on a, in a program, JavaScript program just linked in to our web page. If we are not careful, we could actually end up adding a lot of variables to the global window object. And the global window object, all running applications in this context can access them and we could like mix things up with each other. And it's really important in that environment to be able to structure your code so that you, your code is, is run in your own environment and other code is run in another environment. Uh, and to help us with this, we have something called modules. So we could uh, kind of uh, uh, arrange our code into modules and the module being this self-contained uh, application environment. There are a lot of ways of doing this. I think, and I'm getting back to your question. Uh, one way that you could see is something like this. The syntax is kind of clunky, but uh, no, uh, like that. Um. Uh, 
what I've done here is that I have a self-invoking function. This is called a self-invoking function, a function that calls itself. So I create the function and the function body, and then I use uh, the parentheses to, to just call the function directly. The reason why I have those yellow parentheses is that the compiler, I think, will complain if I don't, because yeah, that will, it's just a quirk. You can't start with a function otherwise, if you don't have the parentheses. Uh, remember, uh, or look at, look at the output. So inside this function, that is a scope. And I create a variable hello in that scope. And then I log hello. So obviously we will log 10. However, this, if I log this, we haven't changed the outer scope. There is nothing on that outer scope. If I were to do this dot dot hello equals 10, this dot hello, it will still be the same. And remember, if, if this outer object was the window object in the browser, this is good practice to do, because then I will run my code in my own scope without polluting window. Who is considered to be calling that function? The outer scope should... <coughs> that is a good question because if the outer scope was considered be to be calling that and I'm using this as I did there, that, that you, you shouldn't do that actually. But it's strange that... Okay. This is a relic from the past. Huh? I can't inside of. I think that question uh, opened up a rabbit hole for me. I need to, uh, I, I, I might be that something else is going on when you have a self-invoking function. Because otherwise I would be able to, to reach that. And I couldn't. I've, maybe the parentheses are doing something with setting the scope to an empty object or something. I don't know. Um, Not sure what you mean. I could use this parenthesis inside the function, the self colon. Yeah, inside here? Uh, yeah, this, this. Yes, this. That one? Yeah, if you, if you delete them. Ah, okay, but yeah, I if we do it like that, then this is just an anonymous function doing nothing at all, and it will never be run. Uh, It will even say that it's not correct because I don't have a name. It needs a name. Um, and now I'm only logging that and, and this one is never called. So that's why we had those parentheses to call it immediately. But yeah, that, that was a side note. Uh, let's go into modules. So be when we start working in the browser and even in Node, we will need modules, uh, basically. And um, there are, I, I, I will not get too theoretical about this, but there are two kind of, or m even three, but two major ways of, of, of working with modules, the common JS and, I forgot the other name, AMS or something like that. Uh, Node, which is the application platform running on a server, has utilized one way of doing this, uh, and often referred to as Node.js modules. Uh, this is what you're working with when you're using MPN, for install, when you can like import other modules from other projects using the MPN, NPM library. And you have Jarn if you want to work with that instead. Uh, those modules, 
work in Node and are heavily used in Node. However, in the browser, we haven't had any modules at all. So in the browser, we have been quite, we had to rely on using Node modules and having a pre-compiler changing this modular, module code into self-invoking functions that I just showed. So, and we will, in this course, we will use something called Webpack to do that. So that basically means that you can write code as you were in Node.js with Node.js modules, and then Webpack will transform this into stuff for the browser that will not intervene with a window object. Um, however, in ECMAScript 2015, we have something call, called ES2015 modules, and that is V3C's approach to modularize the browser. We are really in between right now. Those modules kind of work in many browsers, but not to a full extent yet, but almost. It's, it's kind of, there are some quirks in Firefox, I think, that doesn't support it all the way, but they probably will soon. Uh, but you will be able to use modules natively in the browser, say, the coming year or two. But we're not there yet. So we are really in, in between right now. I will just show you how modules work in, uh, in Node. It's quite simple. Uh, Let's do this the right way, maybe. Uh, now I will create a new file. Uh, greetings.js, and we have an app.js. Uh, in in greeting, greeting.js, uh, I will do this module.exports. What this says is that, okay, this greetings.js will export uh, a function called, say, hello in English which is just a fun simple function uh, returning hello. And it will uh, also export, say, hello in Spanish and in Swedish. Uh, really simple. Of course, this will be more complex as we go on. Uh, to reference this file, greetings.js, inside of app.js, uh, we're doing something called require. Uh, and then we just add the path to the file. However, we can, cannot do this because if we just write a name like this, uh, the node interpreter will try to find this library greetings inside of node modules. I don't have node modules now, but it will assume that this is a public, public uh, uh, library called greetings.js. So we need to start with a dot slash. Whoa, sorry dot slash like that. But you can omit the JS that is, uh, uh, you don't need to, to write dot JS. You can if you like, but you don't need to do that. Uh, and then we could just assign that to a variable. And what greeting is right now, it's an object with all of the exported methods from within uh, greetings dot JS. Console dot log. Greetings. Whoops. Ah, no, go away. So you can see that greetings is an object with say hello in English, say hello in Spanish, and say hello in Swedish. Um, and that is pretty much it. it it's no harder than that. But then now we have two modules. We have one greetings module and one app, app JS module. Uh, of course, if you were to, to use a, a library, you find a library on the web do, doing s something you need to sort an array or whatever, you can just do an npm install and then you reference it with require and the name of the module and then you can start using it. So it's pretty similar to how you work with packages in Java, for instance. Uh, and I really think, actually, if we have a look at uh, 
could just show how the new syntax looks. Um, this is the new syntax for the ES2015 modules. You import something from a module. That is pretty close to Java, or think. Um, and you export by, uh, I should have looked at export then, I guess. Uh, oh, well. You can do that in many ways, yeah. And you just export like that, export function get. So you use the keyword export and import instead. Uh, under the hood, there is probably a lot of differences because MPM, MPM is struggling really hard with starting to support uh, native ES 2050 modules. I think you, at least in Node, you can use import and export, but you need to add a flag, experimental flag, flag to the latest version of Node. Uh, and I know that MP NPM is struggling with importing this kind of library handling in, in, into NPM. They are doing that by creating a new file extension called MJS, I think. But this is, I mean, we are really in a shift right now. So next year I would know more about this because then we will get probably past the threshold. threshold. Would I, what I would like you to know is there is two ways basically of, of working with modules in, in Node and in the browser. Uh, or well, there is only one way in the browser, but in this course we will, and all examples, I am using this syntax with require and exports. Uh, but you're free to use another syntax if you like. Uh, However, this one will work together with Webpack, and I will show you how next week. Yes. Yep. In my here, it's uh, give us, uh, say hello in English, say hello in French. Uh, but how can I see the, the value of, of these? Like yep. Hello. Yep. So in this, in this I have uh, the greetings. <laughs> I do dot say hello in Spanish. I call that function. And it says hola. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you could always, I'm not sure, no, not in this. But if you debug, you can always follow. I mean, if you debug, you can always go into the function declaration on, and look inside of it if, if you like. Yep. It's an object containing three functions. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's an object. But I mean, if we go into greetings, you can al also do something like module.exports um, name equals uh, whoops. And then you see, okay, so I also exported a property called Johan. And what you can see is that this is actually just an object. So you can export every ob any object you like from within a module and just catch that object on the other side. Um, you can export a class. So if you're creating a class called student, you just do module.exports student. Simple as that then you just require that student and you can start working with that class. It's, it's <coughs> really quite simple. Um, okay, so that's a lot of topic to cover on one uh, day. Your heads will explode soon, I guess. Uh, what I would like you to know is Programming in JavaScript is quite simple in many ways because it's quite a simple language. I think Crockford calls it a, s uh, a, s a, a simple, silly language. Uh, and it really is. But it's quite powerful because you can use it in so many different ways. And you can use it in ways that you don't know, like 
with the, the self-invoking functions. I've never tried that, and let's see what happens. Uh, compared to Java, I know half of you will hate this, and half of you will love the language. And those of you who will hate it will probably say that you hate it because you have no clear rules. I mean, when you code in Java, you, you have a path. You know, okay, I create a class, I do this, this, this. It's quite staked out. However, in JavaScript, you're just with a blank paper and, okay, so now what? Oh, well, you can do it like that or that or that or that. You, you can do it in any way you like. And that is quite hard in the beginning because you have this all of those tools and you don't know what to choose in, in, in a certain circumstance. Um, but I think we, we have made a change from last year. And the change is when we come to the browser, we are quite heavily using something called uh, custom elements in the browser. And those custom elements are kind of like giving you a path of how to create those objects in the browser. And I think that is a good thing because otherwise you would have the language that is totally free and then you have the web browser in which you can do it in a hundred different ways. Uh, but those custom elements will probably get you into some kind of mold that will, or path that will get you in the right direction, I think. I, at least that was what the students in Kalmar said uh, when they had this version of the course, that it was clearer. Um, uh, than before. I, I hope so. Um, I've been speaking of Crockford. Uh, I would just like to mention that now we had a lecture four. If you look in those, you have external resources. Uh, can go to that one. Uh, on the bottom of the page, we have external resources. Uh, in this case, it's Crockford on JavaScript, and uh, Crockford being this kind of father of, of even if Brendan Eich was the one creating uh, JavaScript, Douglas Crockford is kind of like the the one outspoken about JavaScript and uh, ha has been been forming the community for many years. Uh, he, he, he recorded a series of lectures 10 years ago and I, I still recommend at least the first couple of ones because in those he talks about where, how did we get where we are today? H how did this language become the language it is? And it's quite good to know if you're coding JavaScript. However, when you get to the later ones, I mean, those are recorded 10 years ago, and ECMAScript 2015 was only on, on, on a paper back then. And uh, a lot of things has happened. But he, he talks a lot about how the changes in ECMAScript 2015 came, came to be. So it could be good to, to, watch, them, uh, to watch them as well. Uh, I've also added... Um, Fun fun functions. I've added some references to MPJ as well. Uh, I, I recommend watching those as well. Um, and I recommend reading up in the book. Remember, the, f the second assignment, we have an oral hearing. And the oral hearing will question you about the theory in the course. Uh, so you will not get, get, get passed by only doing the assignment and think that is fine because you will need to be able to explain the assignment and, and the constructions you've done in the assignment and you also need to be able to answer questions about the, the, the language JavaScript. But I can promise you that I will not get into like, okay, could you please do a pro prototypal inheritance? It's not that kind of questions. It's more like, what's the difference between var and let? Uh, what is a scope? K more of those like basic questions, but you you need to to read uh, the theory as well to be able to pass those uh, hearings. Good. That was that for this lecture. Uh, do we have any questions regarding something that is of interest to all? Um, 
Yeah. So regarding the book, this is the eloquent JavaScript third edition. Uh, the third edition isn't available in paperback yet. It will be in October, uh, but it's totally free online. So please use it online. And it's even better if you use it online because you can alter all the examples. Um, if you want a paperback, um, I think I've mentioned before that uh, developing web the professional web development uh, or something like that by Sakas is a good good book, but you could all there are probably newer books, and I think there is one called You Don't Know JavaScript or something like that. Th that is online as well that you could utilize if you like. I mean JavaScript, you will probably find the best resources online anyways. Uh, because that is how the community is. It's quite open and you will probably find the best resources on YouTube and on open books on GitHub. Next week, we will get into the fun stuff because the fun stuff and the things we've been waiting for is to start coding in the browser and start doing things with JavaScript. I mean, you, you I, I, I mean, I use, the knowledge, the things that we've done today, I use them all the time. Because, I mean, I have it Node installed on my computer. If I need to do some calculations or I need to do some basic, like, filtering out students in a comma-separated file or whatever, it's so neat to just do it in JavaScript. You don't need to create a big project. You just create a file and you go. Uh, so I use JavaScript a lot, not connected to the web. However, it's when we connect it to Internet it, then it becomes more interesting. So, so we will start off by that next week. Okay, I'll be here for yet 20 minutes or something like that uh, uh, until the end of the lecture if you have any questions or something you need help with. Okay, bye.